Okay, so welcome to another edition of Featured Business, brought to you by your host, myself, James Moffat, and our 81st guest, Emma Jane Taylor. So 81, is it a significant number for you at all? 80, I think you said 80, 81 or 85? 81. 81. Well, eight is my lucky number. So uh, the one has no significance. I suppose it's just one of me, right? But eight is my lucky number. So yeah. All right. Okay. Very good. Because a lot of people, coincidentally, although I don't believe in coincidence, I mean, had the number that actually... <gasps> it's an <laughs> angel. 81 is the angel, isn't it? Could be. Yes, lots, it of, is. lots of them are angel numbers. Uh, yes, it is. Well, you are I'm going to just Google that now because, um, or maybe not. Right. Whilst you're doing that, we're just going to go straight into Emily, our uh, weekly singer. Unfortunately, she can't make it today, so she's given us a recording. So I'm just going to play the recording and then we'll come straight back. So let me just share my screen with you. And hopefully this will all work. And then you'll hear. Right, here we go. So let me know if you can't hear it. Well, I guess you can't until I push the button. Beautiful, well, I, a beautiful, beautiful girl and a beautiful voice. Oh, she's really excellent. And she sings, she has her own songs as well. So she normally sings live and not, but not always if she has a, I mean, she works a lot with kids as well. So she, she's a, a piano teacher and she plays the guitar and sings. And there's a cuckoo clock on the wall, if you noticed. I mean, she's originally from London, but she's now living in Lausanne in Switzerland. Wow. Right. So let's go to Emma Jane Taylor. So do, do you have a, a, sh a short name or do people have you? EJ. Everyone calls me EJ. EJ. EJ or M. <laughs> e or M. Or M. 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 Right. So M. 
you are our 81st guest and we're going to learn something about you. Mm. So let me kick this off. So before we get started, I'm just going to take you on a, on a journey, which we do with all of our guests. We take you basically from childhood to where you are now, what you're doing now, and was there any turning points in your life, any memorable experiences, anything you want to share with us? And, and then we can interact as well with the audience. So at any point, you can ask the audience any questions. They're typically quite quiet until we get going. And then they jump in and ask you questions as well. So tell me, first of all, where are you? I mean, we have no idea where you are. So where do you live? I'm in the United Kingdom right now. Um, and have lived in the United Kingdom all of my 49 years, bar three of them when I lived in Spain for three summers. That's when I ran away to, to, to make my life better. Wow. So we're going to learn about that. So 49, you mean 39, you said 39, didn't you? 29, actually. 29, 29 wow. 50 this year and proud of every single one of those years. Do you know what? Uh, just while we're talking about age, my my grandma mm -hmm. uh, and that generation and I think the next generation never wanted to talk about their age I don't ever get that right I mean you know clearly we all kind of know who how old people are I'm proud to be 50 and I'm in well nearly 50 and I'm going to embrace my 50th year because like everybody here we've all had our journey to get to the ages that we are today and we should be able to embrace them not fear them because going forward, if we can enjoy that, this life that we've got today and the life that we've got coming up, then what does it matter how old you are? It's just a number. Absolutely. I completely agree. And I think society has stigmatized us into believing that once you get to 50, that's the end of the road. I like to think the other way around. Once you get to 50, it's a new beginning. Do you know what? I feel better now at 50 than I did at 20 because uh, years and therapy and you, you just become wiser right you become wiser you become more savvy you just become extremely uh, more aware of life and what's going on around you and I think you can enjoy your life so much better um, certainly anyone who's gone through adversity and I have so I think now that I can embrace that life and enjoy it like I didn't enjoy it you know back in my teenage years and you're a beauty a beautiful 49 year old thank you thank you you know when I kind of you know if I go back to you know the early start of my life when you know I remember very clearly happy times you know I lived with my mother and my stepfather I used to go and see my biological father every other weekend he he was my handsome prince I love this guy I mean he was just funny he was just like I, I didn't know any different, right? My parents had separated when I was two. So I had my mother and my stepfather and I had my father every other weekend. That's all I knew. That was all I was, that's all I was used to. So I was happy. And uh, yeah, I had this wonderful man in my life. I had my mother and my stepfather. I think I was a bit conflicted about the, that relationship because I just didn't understand it as a, as a young girl. Um, but yeah, I was happy. And, you know, uh, there my life continued till I was around nine years old. Before we get there, before oh. we get there, you're <laughs> jumping ahead a little bit. Right. So, although we all want to hear the story, so I, I can't place your accent. So, what part of the country are you from? Uh, I'm south. I'm south of the UK. I'm sort of just outside. Uh, I'm near London. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, I'm not sure if you, that's a good thing with my accent or not, but I think I've just kind of like, I have a, a mix of family in me from, you know, being in the, just outside London, my stepfather's, uh, he's from the East End. So uh, I think I got a bit of a mix of that as well when that comes in, you know, um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's me. Yeah. L I, London. I, I, I try to place accents because, where do you think I came from? You're not from Switzerland. Oh. Yeah. But you live in Switzerland, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Okay. And um, I would say I, I kind of picked it up a minute ago. So just keep talking. Well, you you probably wouldn't guess it straight away. Um 
I don't think you're because up. I've moved around a lot in the UK. You've moved around a lot in the UK. I lived in different parts of the UK. I, I think. Have you got a bit of a Cornish accent there? No. Mm. Although some say that actually. West. I think you're definitely West. No. Oh. All right, this I'll isn't... tell you. I'll, I'll spare you the, the pain. Right. I was born in Edinburgh. You have no Scottish accent. No, I was five when I left, which is a long story as well. Um, and then my mum was originally from London, so we moved to, to England. So I lived in Newcastle. So I was actually broad Geordie, way I ate pet. Uh, yeah, a tiny you, bit. You, you didn't know what a monoboot. I now, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How we the lads, right? So then, then moved from there to Brighton. And I grew up in Brighton, lost my northern accent. So instead of saying last and past and grass, last and past and grass. And then, then when I finished my school and everything, went to live in London, then the Netherlands, and then I came to Switzerland. So it's kind of a bastardised English accent. So a lot of people actually don't think I'm English. They say, oh, yeah, what part of Australia are you from? Australia. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, so... Uh, yeah, I lived in the East End then, East End of London. I lived in Bow. Apple all the you know what I remember when we were kids, my dad having jelly deals in the fridge. Yeah. Because that was a real, you know, London yeah, definitely thing East to End do. thing. Oh my goodness. And I, I used to want to vomit when they came into the fridge every weekend. They just looked vile. And I never got into jelly deals. No. But we used to have a lot of um used Windles. to go down to yeah, he used to go down to Billingsgate Market and, you know, by, yeah. at Christmas we used to have this, you know, great array of shellfish on our table on Christmas Eve night. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I just remember that as a beautiful thing, a reminder of Christmas. Yeah, I, I remember as kids we used to go to the beach on the, on the rocks and everything and collect bags and bags, loads of winkles. Yes. And then yes. boil them in a pot and then get a pin and eat them and... If I think about it now, I think, oh, disgusting. But as I kids, know, and actually, I, Brighton's actually one of my favourite places to go, just as a day trip. Yeah. Um, and last time I was there, something happened with someone eating Winkles, and it put me off eating Winkles. They blew their nose at the same time. No, I won't. Should I tell you what they did? Because it might <laughs> yeah, put everyone off Winkles. I don't they know were standing in the queue, so they had their pot of winkles with yeah. their tooth, with the with the tooth, with the pick, the toothpick, mm -hmm. and um, I was behind them, and they were eating. And then they got an itchy ear, and they cleaned <laughs> out their ear with a toothpick <laughs> and put them back in the. And I was like, oh my god, I couldn't, I couldn't eat any more winkles again after that. Uh, I don't know what it is, but after that, I will never eat one. <laughs> it's like a, it's like a you know the muscles it's like a small muscle I, you know i think that's the best way to describe it it's a little well it's like a snail shell isn't it kind of yeah a, tiny a, tiny a small snail shell and you people are gross i mean get, some get people... them on the rocks and things and you take them in a the bag and go and boil them at home and yeah it does sound disgusting now when i think about it i mean we used to have tripe do you remember tripe yeah, we never had. Well, I think even if we did, but I didn't. When I think that. about it, I think, what did I eat when I was a kid? I oh, remember yeah. having my. I remember my mother cooking me liver, <laughs> and uh, the night that we got liver, when she turned her back, me and one of my other siblings would just literally scoop it onto one of our other siblings' <laughs> plate, and so when she turned around, we were like, "Oh, we finished." Yeah. So <laughs> talking about siblings, so how many have you got? I have two brothers. They're older or younger? They're older. Oh. And I think they still think I'm four years old. All right. They still treat you like that. Yeah, they're lovely. Uh, and uh, I have step siblings as well. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, uh, my house was very busy when I grew up, which was nice. Which was nice. Uh, hi, Lynn. I don't oh, know. Lynn's my friend. Ah. Hi. I think it's Lynn. Is that Lynn? Yeah. Is that it you, is. Lynn? It is. It is. It is. Can, ah. can, you, can you appear? Um, no, it's a bad hair day. Hi. Ah. He's in the, I'm, oh, no, it's not, I'm, in, I'm in the car. I've just yes. dropped my twins off. He's so in the car. I'm in the car. Pete's in the car as well. 
far. <laughs> it's a good so, thing about I, Zoom. You can just go anywhere. Yes. So nice where, to see you, my, Lynn. Lynn, where, where are oh, you? Thank you, Andrew. I'm in the UK. Wow, I know that. But anyone yeah. particularly... Oh, sorry. I, I didn't know if this was... Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> I, you... I live in... I live um, just outside High, High Wycombe. All right, okay. So, so Pete's in... Tell Pete where you're from. Uh, Atlanta, Georgia, USA. All right. So a big difference there. So don't <laughs> crash into each other. All right, watch out. <laughs> <laughs> nice to see you, Lynn. And uh, you. So, so I'm going to turn my in. screen off. Thank you. Right. Okay, so let's carry on the story. So your brothers uh, yeah, still, still treat you like a, a four-year-old. Yeah, I think... Um... I think I don't know if you guys got older siblings. Have you got older siblings? Yeah, I've got an elder sister that lives in, in the US, and I've got uh, a younger brother and a younger sister. Wow! But so you're the step- you're the eldest, so you must treat. So I still think my stepdad. My stepdad sometimes says, "I still think of you as being 19. <laughs> mm-hmm. and I'm like, "Well, I wish I was," but I think you get you kind of get stuck in different time zones, don't we? You just yeah. you know forget how much how advanced people have become uh, it's surprising how time has gone and you can go down memory re- lane and and you don't think it's been so long and you think well that that was only a couple of years ago it feels like and it's really like 30 40 years ago so growing yeah. up as a kid did you have any kind of hobbies or anything that you're interested in Oh, so I um, I was a child performer. Uh, I loved horse riding. I was very much into animals, very much into my pets. In fact, mm-hmm. still am. They're a big part of my life. Um, but I was also into dancing. So I was a child performer, professional child performer. As in, um, as in I, I, dancing? I'm a, yeah. I'm, I, well, I'm a, by, da- by trade, I'm a dancer. Um, and I, I was you know, uh, very privileged to have experienced some really great venues over the years. And as a child, I got to perform in the West End in the UK quite frequently. Um, I don't know if you remember My Guy magazines. They were like these photo yeah. shoot magazines. Yeah. So I was quite often in those as well. So from what age were you doing this? Um, I would say, well, I was dancing all my life. I went, I became, I was, I have pictures of me in my tutu when I was around three years old. Um, and I danced all the way through till I was probably around 21, actually. I think 19 was when I sort of went to live in Spain. But when I came back, I'd always, I used to work with a cabaret troupe. I was just bumming around, actually, for three years. And, um, but that was just such a big part of my life performing because that was when I could escape um any of my own sort of personal difficulties so dancing was a big thing for me I loved horse riding as a child um and uh, and like I, said, I loved animals and still do have I had a lot of pets in my life yeah I I did a, a I, I was never a good dancer so I can't say I was a dancer but I, I did do horse riding and yeah you know, some funny stories I could share there uh, particularly on <laughs> getting to know different types of horses because they're not all the same and some can mm. be easily spooked and, and others that you cannot get them to move because they're so kind of placid they just want to stand there all right so but we, we could probably tell her have a whole session I, I remember being on a big pony called Dulcie and uh, behind me was someone on a Shetland pony and oh. I must have been about 10, 11 years old. And I've never, well, it was funny, but it wasn't funny. The, the person behind me on this Shetland, now Shetland ponies, uh, which I'm sure everyone knows, they're just small po- small horses, tiny, tiny horses. The girl on the Shetland pony, the Shetland pony decided that it had enough. So the Shetland pony just went down on its knees and started to roll over. And the girl on the horse had to get off really super quick because she would have been crushed by this Shetland pony. But it was, I don't know, I remember it, it making me giggle, but as, as an adult now, I'd be horrified if I'd have seen that. I really thought this, this girl was going to get crushed by this Shetland pony because they have a mind of their own. Yes. So did you do any horse jumping or shows? Or, or was oh, it yeah, just I did fun? loads. I, oh, I you had, did? Oh, yeah, yeah, I had ponies. I, I was very fortunate that um, I had... I was uh, had one on loan for a amount of years, and then I had my own pony called Bandit, and he'd been terribly abused as 
um, as a young as a young horse. So when he came to me, he was really scatty, but it felt like we worked really well together because I was very scatty and crazy as well. Um, so no one wanted to go near this horse. And if you know horses and, and bits and things, I had to ride him in what's called a gag, which is the like the most severe but bit that you can put on a horse to control it that's how crazy he was so you get on him and he'd rear it up and oh my god I loved it I wouldn't love it now but I loved it back then because it was just we were just but you know what after however long I'd had him for we calmed down together and we just had this great relationship he was a lot of fun he was a show um he was like a little jumping pony so we used to do some great events jumping jumping like big fences uh yeah, a real, real lot of fun. In fact, for many years after I, after we sold him, I used to dream we still had him and I'd forgotten him and left him in a field, not fed him for years. I'm sure there's some significance to that if anyone's a dream. Yeah, uh, probably. We, we had, funny enough, we, we've we had a dream decipherer yes. on the show. And I mean, she could probably tell you what that means. Well, right? I don't have it now. So that, that's a good thing. I'm yeah, hoping. but if you've got any other dreams that you want to be deciphered, then... Yeah, she can do that. Yeah. She, I, she, I, I, I used she to have lives a... in London, actually. She... What's her name? Sheila. Uh, I'll give you, the, give you the links to her. Send me her it, link, yeah. But she will, for sure, she watches all the shows afterwards if she can't make it. So. Oh, well, Sheila, if you're watching, connect with me. I'm Emma Jane Taylor on LinkedIn. I have a reoccurring dream about a dolphin. Oh, very much. And an aeroplane that crashes. Oh, yeah, she'd definitely be able to tell you something then. Yeah. Yeah, because she she's originally from New York and, and she had these vivid dreams about 9-11 before it happened. Oh, gosh. And I'm not going to tell you any more. You have to speak to her. But I mean, uh, or I'll, yeah. I'll share the link also to her recording because she, she talks about it as well. Yeah, I'd love to see that. But yeah, so we, we, we try to have diverse guests, you see, so they're not all the same and they all tell different stories. And I mean, everybody does tell a different story anyway, but I mean, the more diverse, the better. So let, let's carry on with you. So did you dream of having kind of an acting career? Uh, because, yeah, I mean, being in, on the stage and... and a I, always, I always wanted to be a dancer. I was... Um, do you ever remember a show in the UK? Lynn might, I don't know. Actually, no, Lynn's younger than me. There's a show in, there was a show in the UK called The Mini Pops and um, we all auditioned for it and it was a big thing here in London. Um, and I got interviewed at the end and I had orange juice all around my mouth. Uh, I was absolutely exhausted because we'd been auditioning and dancing and they said, what do you want to be? And I'd love to find the video. And I said, oh, I want to be a dancer or a horse rider. And that was it. And I, I, I didn't get in. My friend, actually, my friend got in and it was a brilliant, brilliant show for kids. Um, but yeah, I really, that's all I really wanted to do. But I think also uh, as, we, as, as we mature and uh, develop in life, I felt a bit more pressure of what I should be doing. And dance, it didn't seem to be ticking the box. Um, it wasn't the corporate world that I think that I felt, I felt that I should be in. I felt, I think I felt a bit of pressure, you know, to be in, you know, the white collar industry. So I, I was in the dancing world and I was in that environment for many years, but then I went into corporate into my early twenties because that's where I felt that I should be. <laughs> uh, but it's not where I stayed, thankfully. Okay. So we'll come on to where you are now. Uh, shortly but I just want to take you back to to where you're trying to leapfrog into whereas when you were nine years old so that was probably the biggest turning point in your life at nine years old when I was first sexually assaulted yeah um I, and I actually when when that happened I don't remember um what I felt afterwards I just know that I was very confused and unsure and upset by what happened because the guy had been my friend and um he had he had he was a restaurant owner of a, a restaurant in Greece where we'd been going pretty much every night so he would have seen that me and, and many, many other the children uh, who liked animals and, and we went out to, to see them every night with him he took us away from the parents eating uh, sorry to jump in so, so just kind of backtrack a bit so you went to Greece on holiday a family holiday it was a family holiday in Greece and um you know back in the day 
people we were so much more relaxed about this stuff and in many ways I think we still are but we you know hopefully these conversations will remind people not to be so relaxed about uh, lots of things and so, um, so th this was the time I mean you mentioned earlier that your parents had split up I mean th this was with your my mother, mother and my stepfather yeah all right so, so your parents had split up at what age were you then I was two when my parents had separated so I don't remember them I just remember my mum and my stepdad Mm -hmm. um and we were on this family holiday in Greece um and yeah I mean we used to go to this restaurant and the restaurant owner used to take the children not just me but the children away from the parents eating and outside and, and when you say outside I mean we were hardly a stone's throw away from where the parents were we were just in a bit of a darker area I could still hear the music I could mm -hmm. still hear the you know lots of smashing of plates and you could smell the food and just a real Greek atmosphere was it a greek island or the mainland it was uh, a greek island mm -hmm. and so yeah and this guy had had taken taken us away from the parents most nights through the the two-week holiday um but and he was a really a nice of, guy a group of kids then yeah i mean all the children away from the parents i wasn't alone it was me and you know i, I think there were like eight maybe nine kids with us one of them was my like my pen pal friend of similar um, similar ages. Yeah. Oh, well, I guess so. I don't know actually. I would just say they're probably all around the similar ages. Mm -hmm. But we were kids. Mm -hmm. We didn't know this stuff. Why would we? We were just you, innocent you kids going you, out with a uh, lovely restaurant owner to see the lovely animals outside. And I love animals. I I dearly love animals. They're a big part of my life. Um, well, I think any kid would have wanted to do that. I mean, I'm sure. I would have also, everybody. Yeah. I mean, my kids, I mean, I mean, thinking about it, I mean, if someone said, oh, you go and see the animals, you'll think, oh, that's good. We can have, as parents, have a break from the kids. Sure. You wouldn't think anything other than... Well, you than... wouldn't think untoward, anything untoward, right? Exactly. And that's where, you know, I hope by sharing my conversation, my, my voice and, and what's gone through, what uh, gone on in my life can help parents think twice you know yeah great that the man wants to take the animals out but go with them one mm -hmm. parent go with them mm -hmm. um so yeah so you know that was that was when I was nine years old and it was just um, with you though or other kids yeah he 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 was with his brother so there was two of them and then we, they take us outside I can remember exactly what they were wearing they were wearing all this black outfit and they had this red scarf uh, around their neck because they used to do all the Greek dancing as mm -hmm. well mm -hmm. and uh for some reason, he just pulled me away from the group um, and just into the shadows. And I, I, you know, and I think when I look back, I think, gosh, you know, it's, you know, this is this is what I teach now. Right. This is what mm -hmm, I teach to mm -hmm. kids and parents. Mm -hmm. That wasn't right. Um, but I didn't know it wasn't right. I just I guess you just freeze. And, you know, after the assault, I remember running like a bat out of hell back inside. Um, but no one. No one asks you if you're all right because you just they, no one would have expected that. But I mean, I mean, not going to spare in the details and everything, but I mean, after it happened, I mean, and then you went back inside with the other kids. I mean, how were you? I mean, were you in tears? Were you emotional? Were you in shock? Or I think I was in shock. And in, in, if I'm honest, I think there was a bit of a memory block after that because trauma does that. Trauma mm -hmm. will. Um, trauma stops you having a bit of a having a memory and so yeah so that from that from that moment on I don't really remember much of the rest of the holiday um and I don't really remember what happened after that until the next significant thing which was obviously with my father but so yeah so at that time for me was just so complex when I look back because I don't have the memory that my friends might have of their their, their youth you know want to but recently, my my old school friends have been in contact and we've reconnected um, and they reminded me of the power parties we had at 10 and 11. And they shared me shared pictures with me of the, the hedgehog cakes. And, mm -hmm. and it's so hard to remember. And it's quite distressing, actually, at times. So I've had to go through sort of some recovery on that because. Do you think because of the the emotions of what happened at the time, you deliberately kind of block it out because you don't want to recall it. 
well, it's how our bodies work, how our brain works when there's anything traumatic. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and Julia is nodding there, you know, that when something traumatic has happened, our body's response is to sh- shut down and survive. And, you know, we and, and um, I'm sure Lynn can relate to this as well. We just close down um, and and carry on. And that's our survival. That's our way to survive and get through. Uh, from that moment, I mean, when you went back in the restaurant, you you kind of carried on as in nothing had happened, or, or your your parents at the time saw something. Or... You know, I, I I think I just carried on, and I, one thing I do remember is my mother knocking on the bathroom door, saying, "Are you okay? Are you okay?" That's it. That's all I remember. Right, <laughs> uh, and during the holiday, I mean, it affected the holiday. You tried to think kind of block it out and carry on as normal you know you're asking me questions I don't really have many answers to I think you know I think I just from the training and and experience and work that I do now um in this space is that you just that's the way that's your coping mechanism is to block it out so I don't have I don't have any significant memory of being nine or ten I have vague recollections of being eleven uh, and 12 and then obviously until the, the next traumatic event uh, it was very it's very hazy it's choppy it, it's you know when I went through all my recovery years when I say recovery is my therapy when I was 23 you try to do a lot of um reconnecting and so I worked with some um some psychodynamic therapists I worked with an A to Z of team of therapists actually for about 20 odd years but you know, you do a lot of work trying to go back to situations, to reconnect, to go back to the little Emma. Um, and actually, for the most part, you, you can unlock, but actually sometimes it's too much to go so far back. Um, so your body resists it and your therapist will take you where you need to be. Yeah. So you mentioned, I mean, then that affected the rest of your life I mean growing up as a kid I mean from the age of nine I mean you had still had to go through kind of your adolescence and everything else and then you you mentioned something else the relationship with your biological father broke down yeah so um uh, like I said at the beginning this this man he was uh, my biological father my my hero my prince he was just the best thing since sliced bread and um he, he had remarried and had another family and I used to go there, uh, like I say, every other weekend. And then um, my next significant memory was really when I had, I, mean, I had a memory when I started school and a couple of things that happened in school. And then when I um, was around 12 years old, he picked me up to take me horse riding. And it was a drive that was just so bizarre. He just seemed very different. A, a, a drive we'd done for forever um and then just before we get to the horse riding stables he pulls into a lay-by by the side of the road and he stopped the engine turned off the car and he looked at me and he said you know it's a bit of a problem in our relationship and I was like I don't know what this means I don't know what a problem in our relationships means I was only 12 years old um, and it, it was a very complex time. It was um, sort of the highlights really at that time where it, it, I think there was difficulty in the families and the relationships with, the, with, the, with my parents. And I was due to see him on a, a weekend that fell on Mother's Day. Um, but obviously my mum wanted me on Mother's Day. And uh, there was a lot of conviction at the time I was a child performer so I was very busy on weekends and he never really felt like he saw me um, but when he did see me we used to go horse riding um, but anyway that's all just neither here nor there that's kids that's life um, anyway he he said look there's a problem in our relationship and you know your mum wants to see you on Mother's Day I never really see you uh, but you know what it's your choice that was it I didn't get any other kind of um uh, what might happen if I had made any choices it was just my choice so he rang me at home and I remember picking up the phone and hi daddy and he said look you know have you had any more thought about the weekend and I said yeah I said you know daddy I want to see you but it's mother's day and I want to stay with mummy and he said you know you've made your decision I can't see you again and he put the phone down 
But did he and say why? No. It was very, for me, uh, it was because I chosen to see my mum, but it was obviously bigger than that. It wasn't, this was his, this was his fault. This was his responsibility. And I will never understand it. Uh, and that's it. I never, I never saw him again. And to this day, you've never seen him again. Um, so uh, he turned up at a funeral, a family funeral. Uh, he stood next to me while we were scattering the earth. And I didn't realise he was there. I said, oh, sorry, because it, it, it was a, it was my uncle, his brother. His uncle, my uncle, his brother was like my father when this guy was, my dad wasn't around. And of course, you know, he was a lot older. I said, oh, sorry, obviously you're his brother. And he just took it from me and that was it, walked off. Did you recognise him then? Yeah, yeah. I saw him a couple of times at some family things, but he never came near us. He never, he just kept out of our way. And it was heartbreaking, James, you know, can, this, this, this guy was the love of my life. And, um, and so for years, I, I couldn't make a decision because I felt that if any decision I made would cause someone to leave me. So I went through, and, and that's when I was 12, the reality of what had happened at nine kind of hit me square between the eyes. Um, the memories were coming back, the triggers, the smells, the, you know, the, the, the trauma of that. And then obviously my father leaving left a, left a hole like he wouldn't believe in a younger, you know, in my life just because I, I loved him. Right. And loved him with every inch of my body. Um, so losing him was, difficult uh painful turbulent traumatic it then made it a very complex relationship for me and my stepfather because I blamed everybody else um I then hated everybody else um I would say um I was a really nice girl as a child really nice girl and now I was not a really nice girl <laughs> I went down some slippery paths drugs drinking I became bulimic, addicted to... But that was everything. kind of an escapism from the reality you were living in. Yeah, of course. And yeah. um, it was dark. It was dark, you know. And, I mean, the support... I mean, did you get support from your, your mum and stepfather? Everyone supports you in the way they feel they should support you. Mm -hmm. um, no, I think... You know, when you go back to those 1980s, you're talking about a society that didn't like to talk about mental health, didn't like to talk about child sex abuse, uh, fathers abandoning them. Um, so they weren't equipped like we are now. And I still think people aren't equipped now, but they weren't equipped like we are to talk about this stuff. So it wasn't that no one loved me, but there was a lot of upset in the family, right? Because of what he'd done, not just to me, but also to my brothers as well because it wasn't just me but that's their story obviously they, they need to talk about that not me so there was a lot of drama going around and so I guess everyone was trying to soothe things over in the way they felt they should I, you know, I have a I have a great relationship with my mother and stepfather I love them dearly I don't blame them for any of this but for many years I was very troubled by by them and uh, it was a turbulent time as I progressed in my my young teens and of course you know I had another episode that comes as well but um, I got more and more angry more and more violent I'm not a violent person um, but that was my way of dealing with the difficulties around me um, and so I can see it now I can see it clearly and I see it now in other people because of what I've under what I've gone through um so, so, so yeah it was painful uh, yes I I mean it's easy for people to say I can imagine but we can't imagine we just use those words because we weren't there and it's not us but I mean yeah it, it must have been very traumatic but from that now if we kind of fast forward to where you are now and you, you're actually using your experience not, not just to help yourself, but I mean, obviously to help others to, to realize, because I, I remember kind of back in, in the times that I was a child, uh, things like this weren't talked about. 
it, it was kind of brushed under the, the carpet. You don't talk about that. What happens at home? I mean, it used to literally be what happens at home stays at home. Right? And, it, and do you know what, James? It's still very much like that. I'm I'm doing what I can and with other people that I know to break that mold because mm -hmm. we really do need to help people understand they have a voice. And, you know, I, I, I didn't think I had a voice to speak up. You know, I, I didn't want to speak out about my dad, even though he'd hurt me catastrophically. I didn't want to say anything bad about him because I kept thinking he'll come back. You know, mm -hmm. every every Christmas and birthday, I waited for him to send me a birthday card. Then that never came. I used to run down to the letterbox when the postman came. But I was like, yeah, next year, next year. So I had him on a pedestal um, and I wouldn't have anything bad I'd said about my father. Because he, in my eyes, was still this beautiful man. And if you talk to anyone who's gone through any kind of abuse, mental, emotional, physical, they will say that, right? You still put these people on a pedestal when you love, have loved them so much, even though they've treated you badly. And of course, then you add immaturity to that mix. There was no way of me being able to understand that or be supported in the correct way because we didn't live in that world. Yeah. I mean, it must have been... I mean, he remarried, you said, and he, he had some other children as well. So it, it must have been extremely difficult. I mean, not being in his position, but I mean, to, to leave one family and start another one and then completely cut yourself off from a family that you've got and then not seeing them growing up. I mean, I don't know if I could ever do that, knowing that I've got three of my young kids and even if I'm not with them for a day, I'm, I'm missing them and you probably hear them in the other room now so yeah. yeah and I think that's a really important point and that's why you got to remember this maybe isn't the decision wasn't coming from someone who had a sane thought process or was driven in a way that was not the way that you and I would think because what person in their right mind would walk away from their kids and what woman in their right mind would want to stay with a man who gets rid of their kids? Exactly. So, I mean, I probably, couldn't. I wouldn't be with any guy no. who would do that to their yeah. kids. I'm like, what kind of person are but you? But that I mean, does that's happen. Just... I mean, that happens. That they seem that oh, they've met another person, man or woman. I mean, depending on who's leaving who, and then they have another family, or they kind of adopt the kids that they weren't their biological ones, and they've started another family. And, and left their own biological ones behind. And I think, how, how could you do that? But I mean, that could be a whole new topic that we could discuss. But let's kind of fast forward a bit in the essence of time. So Pete had to drop off, but I mean, he sent a message here. Yeah, I still and saw he, that. He wants to obviously connect with all the people here. So, so let's learn a bit about what you're doing now. So what are you doing? And how are you getting your message out and well, you, you mentioned earlier about TED talks and things and I've seen you're pretty active so should you just tell us a bit more about what you're doing um yeah if I could just skip back to probably one of the most important parts to that younger story is mm -hmm. when I was 13 a family friend became my father figure and it was so nice to have this guy around me but ultimately he groomed me and sexually abused me then for the next three years Oh, no. um so from 9 3 to 16 so when you look at that sort of the significance of my story and you know for years I didn't realize I didn't have a childhood just for years I didn't realize I thought it was my fault that all of this had happened and it wasn't so you know you don't you know I'm not into blaming I don't want to blame anyone here but clearly I the difficulty of what happened and and my family friend the family friend who then groomed and abused me from 13, 14, 15. I stepped away when I was around 16. I fell off, uh, severely fell off the wagon at 17. Um, attempted suicide, late teens, early 20s. That was a cry for help, by the way. That wasn't something that I necessarily wanted to do. Uh, clearly, when I hit my 20s, I moved into PTSD and, uh, and all sorts of other difficulties, triggers and uh, realities. Um, which is why I went into therapy at 23. So, yeah, so fast forwarding to where I am now uh, at 49, you know, 30 years after I went in, 36 years, 
Oh uh, yeah, 36, no, 26 years after I went into therapy, I found my voice. Like actually when I was 45, um, uh, I, I was success, been very successful in my community businesses as the founder of Stageworks Performing Arts School, um, Nutritious Works and Wellbeing. So I very much my work was around performing and wellbeing and that's where I sort of stayed. When I left school, my teachers told me I was a failure. I was a girl going nowhere. They labeled me a juvenile delinquent. They put me into junior psychiatric care at 13. And um, no one looked at looked what was going on in my life. They just kept slamming me down, slamming me down. And actually you come to, you come when people tell you enough about how you are as a child, you start believing it. So most people thought I'd be dead or in prison by the time I was 20. And I had to do a lot of work to become a businesswoman running my businesses, having that confidence. You know, I was very passionate and enthusiastic about performing arts. I was very passionate and enthusiastic about well-being, about helping people. I'm, I was fortunate enough to have been invited to present the well-being show for That's TV when I was sort of later in my 30s. Um, and then I became the lead presenter and I stayed there for four years. But it was there that I discovered I had imposter syndrome and I felt a fraud because Everyone saw me as a successful businesswoman um, that had everything. Um, and for me, any success is not monetary. It's not about that. It's about what I've had to achieve. And I didn't talk about my personal life at all. I didn't want to. I never thought I would, actually. So it was a real surprise when at 45, I thought, you know what? I, I, need, to sh I need to get it out there because if I can help one person go through their difficult story or silence or abuse or parental um, abandonment that it will have all have been worth it and so I I wrote my book I was asked to be on the front cover of a couple of magazines I then got invited to speak at some really big expense at the football stadiums here in the UK and I've been sort of speaking in my business for years and it seemed okay and then I get to the stage and I'm thinking shit what am I doing there's like 500 people in this room a uh, table of my mum and my stepdad a uh, bunch of my friends and here I am and they put my my story on the videography all around the stadium I had stick in my throat I'm like what am I doing but actually do you know what when I did that for the first time in front of all those people my world changed uh, I thought it might car crash my career and I actually thought you know what I don't care anymore I just want to help people um, I see that what happened to me as a child wasn't my fault yeah, it was sad. You know, I lost my dad. And but actually, was it better than I had lost someone like that in my life than keep someone who would treat people that way? So I started a new process of development. I work. I'm very fortunate to have a strong team of people around me. I, ha I, I have like I employ like 30 people working part time. I have five admin people, two of them are my PAs. So I've grown and grown and grown and grown in business. And now on this side of my life with my writing, my speaking, um, it's come because I've had the strength and brave, you know, the strength and I've been brave enough to speak up and speak out. So my work now as a corporate trainer, development coach um, and speaker is all kind of based around my story in life and what I've learned and what I've taken forward. You know, I've worked with therapists for over 20 years and I now have. Well, I do work with therapists now, but I don't work to go back over my private life. I work to go forward and have clean air. Yeah, I, I think, I mean, what you shared even now, although, I mean, we could talk and talk for, for a long time, but actually, I mean, to, to see the, the, the true person, the inner person come out, I mean, you would have carried that probably through your whole life if you hadn't have, kind of got it off not necessarily got it off your chest but but being able to to share that because if you think particularly of that era there was probably many many things that happened behind closed doors that, that people never saw and, and never identified and, and at that time kids would blame themselves through personal experience, I mean, they would think, well, it was my fault. I, I got myself in that position. It, it's me. I, I'm to blame. And because they, they felt that they were to blame, they didn't necessarily share what really happened because they, they thought they were guilty. And if they share that, then yeah, they're causing a problem for someone else. And they didn't want to be the troublemaker either. So 
they would suppress it. And that generation definitely did that because I've heard of so many stories like that. And even like with my own family stories like that. So, so for, for you to come up on stage for the first time and think like, right, I have a, this successful career, but if it all goes down the pan, then so be it. But I, I have to get, I have to say this. And so that very first moment must have been so nerve wracking. I remember my first time ever doing public speaking. I mean, and I was talking about something kind of more jolly than this. And, and I mean, excuse my friends, I was shitting myself. And you know, I was thinking, how are they going to react? Will I forget what I'm going to say? Will I mess the whole thing up? But once I'd done it, I embraced that and I felt so empowered. I wanted to do it again and then again and again. And then I had no fear of doing it. It didn't matter where you put me, I, I would do it. So I guess you kind of, from that first experience, thought, shit, now, now I've done it, right? And oh, yeah, I was, let the cat out. I was shaking mm -hmm. like, like a pneumatic <laughs> drill when I came <laughs> off that stage and exactly that you know the next day I thought oh it's okay and actually it did upset people of course in my personal life because mm -hmm. you're putting stuff out there that makes them feel guilty and they, but I'm like you know you can't feel like that because it's not I'm just one in million I am one in millions who've mm -hmm. gone through this and we've got to help parents and kids and families and so you know you have to either stand with me or let me go absolutely i can't i can't i just interject because it's so dear to my heart because i see how it is i just started a parents academy at the moment because i think parents need to understand their kid better because they're coming also from a complete different generation it's yes it's scary completely different right and we need to be in a position to put ourselves into that into the shoes of the kid and what they're going through and and also build that rapport, be the first point of the safe harbor for the kids and not pushing away. Although all the parents are saying, do this, that, you didn't do this and, yeah, and always kind of, you know, it's not about why, it's about what happened to you. For example, in your situation, what happened to you that this or how you evolved, right? These emotions that you have. So really about identity, about also the kid to teach, that's a separate thing, to teach about how to articulate, how to voice, how to create a relationship. It's so important, specifically now because we are in digital and that's even getting more worry and scary because we've got cyberbullying. Oh, have got and that's, a, that's another show on itself and it worries yeah. the hell out of me yes. for the next generation. And I think, you know, that's definitely a big, big, yeah. big, big, huge Absolutely. conversation. And we can talk for hours with this, you know, yeah. so I'm just stopping now. But and thank you. And do you know what? Thank you. And I think, you know, when I look back over my life to where I was and where I am now, um, you know, I hated my stepfather, hated him. And then when I was 19, wow. this was, this was, well, because I didn't have a dad and he was in my life. And I'm like, you know, you're not my dad. My dad's here on this pedestal. And he's like, but I, I needed to work it out. Right. I needed to become mm -hmm. a bit smarter. But if I can just quickly say this is uh, when I was 19. So seven years after my father had left, I, um, my stepfather had, was rushed into hospital with a heart problem. And I remember my heart doing something that I don't think it had done for about seven years since my father left. And I was like, where is he? Where is he? He was in London. I ran up. I, I just got hot footed it up to London. And he was there lying under wires um, in intensive care. And it was like someone who had, it was like a pacemaker. It was like this little flick of like feeling back. It wasn't dark. And, and I'm, I remember saying to him, please don't die. You're the, the only man who's looked after me and loved me all my life. And um, I need you. And my mum and my brother were in the room at the time and they had to leave because they knew at that point, up until that point, I, I'd, I'd, I would punch him. Right? I mean, I, I was nasty to him. Uh, anyway, they went and I didn't leave his bed for, for 48 hours. And we watched, uh, he used to love dad's army. 
And uh, so we watched Dad's Army all weekend while he was like on morphine coming off. <laughs> da, 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 da. And I said, look, I'm just so sorry. I love you. I want you to stay. Stay with me. Don't leave me. I need you. I need you. Uh, and it felt really dramatic. And here I was with a guy who was minutes from death. Uh, he's now 86. He's my best friend. And he he has been but we're 85, sorry. Uh, he's been by my side through everything. And uh, I am so grateful to that man and to my mum for not walking away from me through those dark times and for, for believing in me, even now through, you know, they, sometimes they find this uncomfortable, some of the stuff I think about, but they now get it. Now, my mum sometimes likes one of my posts now and I'm like, yay. This is great. This and is I great. need to go, James, I need to go. Nice to see you, Julia. And they are be connected over LinkedIn. Let's stay in yes, touch. Thank you. Touch. Bye, Julia. Bye, bye. Thanks. That was, that's a, a magical story. So you've turned kind of that resentment into love. Well, yeah. Um, and I think when I started doing that, I changed the pedestal, right? Mm -hmm. I started realising. And that's when I went to Spain for three years. I needed to clear my head out. I just, I needed to get away and I needed to, I needed to, I needed just to let go. But um, I drank my way through Spain, came back, went into therapy, stopped drinking, haven't drunk since. Um, so so it, it's been a, a hell of a journey. And, and then to come back and then become a successful business woman as well. And, and and now to actually share your story. So, I mean, I I admire your your courage because there's, there's so many people that will probably listen to this as well and and are out there that don't have the courage to actually say what really happened to them, and that is the biggest problem. Is they they they, they can't let it go and they can't express it. They live with it. Um, and that's what I hope and that's what I want to encourage I want to encourage other people to speak up and mm -hmm. I want other people to experience the positives that I have because for years it was just horrible the sort of speaking up but now I realize the, the power of it and so encouraging others to to find their success whatever that might look like is one of the biggest things that, you know biggest things in yeah. my life now I mean, the fortunate thing is we have technology that enables it now. So I don't have to physically go to watch you to understand and hear your story. We can share through like, like we are now and also like with TED Talks and other things. So, so tell us a, a bit, I mean, I know, I know we talked earlier about TED Talk. So you've, you've done a TED Talk and you're going to share the links as well so we can check them out. But how did you do... A TED talk and where did that come kind of in this process was it early on or a bit a bit later the TED talk was in 2021 so last year oh, right. okay. and I've been sort of talking to people about doing a TED talk for a while and you know as a, as a professional speaker um, and I don't know anyone who 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 else here is a professional um, speaker but you know you, you have to go through a lot of experience and and um, by Laszlo and training and not tr not training but training through your work mm -hmm. um, to, to to really sort of become this hone your skills mm -hmm. uh, so I had been sort of in that space speaking for a few years uh, two years ago three years ago I just wouldn't as much as I'd like to have done a TED talk I wasn't ready for it um, and it I just knew when I did do a TED talk it had to come from the heart and it mm -hmm. had to have meaning so Last year, uh, I started looking at different ways of my work. I have um, I work with a, a beautiful lady called Daphne. She works very close with me with my branding and all my product, mm -hmm, all my mm -hmm. projects. And uh, we decided it was probably best to sort of fine tune what I was doing and hone in on the things I did. So I got a lot of projects out of the way last year that I, I have never gone back to. And I've kind of made the world that I'm in my world, like from the from my businesses through to my speaking, to my writing, to, to the work that I do as an activist. And we created this project called Project 9010, which is going to be um, is part of my charity, my new charity, which is being set up at the moment. And we, we got the 9010 number because 9010 is really sort of about 90% of people who are abused are abused by people they know. That's a statistic. And that's what we know. So it just seemed right to sort of 
hone my TED talk around that. I was now in a space where I felt comfortable. Um, the guy who had the TED, who, who, who did the TED talks wanted me to do it. And I thought, you know what? This is right. This is right. I, I'm clear about my message. And I think whatever we do in life, whoever you are, whatever your message is, be clear about it. And so, so it came about and uh, yeah, I was invited to do the TED talk. I recorded it in a studios um, in Oxfordshire. Um, and then it was sent back to Ireland to be uh, cleared before it went off to TED to be published. Uh, and yeah, since then it's been watched. I mean, it's been watched, I don't know, 13,000 times, but that's tiny, kind of nothing really when you think there's 8 billion people in this world. That needs to be seen by 8 billion people not just my talk, but anyone talking about this stuff, because this is real and this is happening. But a lot of people want to go, oh, this, I don't want to know about that stuff. But actually, you're a fool, right? Any parent who doesn't want to know about this stuff is not going to protect their children in the right way. I know people who share, I know people in America contacted me to say they've shared it with their children, their teenage children, um, which is great. If they feel that that's what they want to do, then great. It's right. better than better than the other. You're right. I mean, there's certain things that you don't get taught at school. Yeah. I mean, and we become naive at school as well. We become too trusting. Mm. And I mean, I remember the adverts, don't talk to strangers, right? So don't talk to strangers. So we know that. We know the difference. I'm not going to talk to a stranger, but sometimes don't talk to the people you know, because they can be strange as well. So... Uh, but you're not talking about, I mean, exactly what you said earlier when you went to, to, to Greece and you, know, you went outside with the owner and you went to see the animals. And you said a parent, one parent, at least from the group of kids, should have gone there as well. Yeah, and that's what we do now, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, I, I, I would have that as learned behavior to be able to do that. If I saw any kids going off with a man out the back, I'd be like, well, let's, let's take an adult with them. Let's take a parent. Let's take, you know. Exactly. So at least, uh, I mean, you, you can never not be too cautious at some things. And I mean, what you said with the 90-10, I mean, 10, like a lot of the time it comes from people you actually know. Yeah, but we're mm. teaching kids stranger danger. Now, mm -hmm. I don't know about you, but I learned that at school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm still afraid of the guy in the white van. Even yeah, now, exactly. right? if, if I'm walking up a lane on my own and a white van comes, I'll be like, oh, God, he's going to kill me. Yeah. But actually, it was the reality was it was much closer to home. And it always is. Or well, most often. It, absolutely. And from stories I've heard over the years, it, it's normally someone that, you know, that yes. you've trusted. Yes. So you've, you've already gone over the barrier of not knowing them to a trust. Yeah. And then the trust has been abused anyway uh we, we we kind of are on time now right so we need to wrap this up but uh, i mean you can always come back another time i mean and, and to tell more of your story i mean i'm very fascinated i want to catch up with you personally as well and uh, just to share a few more things with you and i'm sure kind of the audience do i mean everybody has enjoyed the, the story and, went, and wants to learn more and connect with you and see how we can work respective businesses or ideas together. And just for it, goodbye, maybe I want to say something because I need to jump in another meeting. So this year I also turned uh, 25 twice, but uh, in March I become 50. <laughs> so it, it's not hurting, it's uh, quite an emotion. So thank you for this um, emotional talk that uh, you shared with us. Uh, I think everybody has different, uh, because when something hurts you, it's a big pain for you, usually. I also think that people need to speak up. And this is something that it's, uh, from one side, people feel the shame, stress, different factors that really stop from uh, uh, sharing this and uh, properly manage this because it's a situation. And if they are not properly managed, it's, uh, it normally gives a significant footprint also in the behaviors. Uh, 
uh, in the future. So I also hit uh, practically every person here some uh, shakes in life and people need to, uh, it's really to manage and to continue the life because life is the greatest thing we have to, even if there is a second or so, it's, uh, we need to value what we have. So this is, uh, uh, so I, I really need to move to another uh, mm -hmm. meeting with client. I'm sorry for uh, it was client calling me. I had to pick. The... Oh, it's, it's been lovely to meet you, Boyan. And, you know, I do remember everyone has a story and it's all relative. And if my voice can help someone with their story and where they are in their recovery, whatever it, whatever that story is, it might not be child sex abuse, um, then I, then it will have all been worth it. So uh, you, it's, years, you said child safety a few years ago. We built a website. It's called Child Safety Map. You have? No, no, it's not me. We did it for a client, but this project failed because uh, it was full of articles for uh, very good articles for parents, how to manage drug addiction, sexual abuse, all this stuff, how to speak to young people, different age. In addition, it was uh, asking for the audience to, if you see, let's say somewhere a cable is showing up or a hole or something, uh, this site was asking people to mark dangerous zones so don't go in this area after eight o'clock or something where it's in dark hours. So, uh, but what happened, it fell because it needed tremendous funding because most of people were really happy to see such thing exist, but they were not contributing to this. Mm -hmm. this was the model did not work to yeah and i think there's a lot in fact someone on linkedin has con contacted me yesterday about um some of the process they're doing to block um firewalls of child sex abuse imagery um and i did share it on my linkedin profile yesterday but uh look we're talking about it now and uh hopefully we can get more and more people talking and and that will always be the most important touch, if you think keep in touch uh, look yeah i mean anything of, uh, i'm set, i'm setting up a charity i need all the support i can get i have I have uh, six advisors, I have um, 10 ambassadors um, and three trustees already ready with me in the wings to go. But obviously, I don't know if you know, I'm doing a challenge a month at the moment to raise awareness for the work that we're doing to raise funds. I will check more carefully your profile, your website. Yeah, check, check more carefully. We'll, we'll check this and we'll come back. I have to go. Okay, bye, Boyan. Thanks, Have Jane. a nice day. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thanks, Boyan. Anyway, you have been an absolutely wonderful guest. And yeah, I mean, your, your stories definitely help connect people together. And it is the stories. I mean, everybody has a story to tell. Absolutely. And without a shadow of a doubt. And, and we all tell stories and we all love stories. And I talk about that because I'm, I'm a storyteller and I actually help people tell their stories, particularly children, right? And that, that is something I'd like to talk to you offline about. Okay, well, definitely talk to me. And I, and I, and I, I hope Lynn doesn't mind, but Lynn is a friend of mine and I'm very proud of her as well because she's finding her voice now and that makes me feel really good. But it's true because if you look at... You don't mind, Lynn. <laughs> I mean, if you look at the connections that, that you've created, I mean, just on, on this, talking about a subject that is kind of a taboo thing. And you oh, yeah, don't no talk one wants to that. talk about it. But the reality is it's happening every single day. Yeah. Some, some child, some Every will probably now, right? This child is being sexually abused. Yeah, exactly. I mean, not just one, but thousands all around the planet. And mm -hmm. a lot of the time it could be avoided if, if they followed a few simple principles, like, like you mentioned. I mean, like the, the simple one is one parent go out with that group. I mean, and then nothing happens. Right. Absolutely. So something Maybe. simple like that is a is 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 a is a quick fix in a way. That one thing could have changed your whole life. Look, there she is. She's come on camera. Hi, Lynn. <laughs> hey. Right, so um, I mean, Lynn. I mean, th this 
kind of forum and then this platform that we do is about people sharing stories. You don't have to have a business per se. It's all about sharing stories. And the, the more diverse, the better, because it helps connect people that if we all talked about the same subject, it could get boring. But if we all talk about multiple different subjects, then we can see the significance of each and every story. And actually every story interweaves with everyone else's. So it doesn't matter if you're talking about technology. I mean, it'll still come down to, to this because you talked about now that being online, that children are more exposed to things that you probably don't see because they pick up their iPad or whatever and off they go and you just think they're looking at kind of innocent things. And the reality is they're probably not. And being groomed for something because a friend is playing a certain game and play with my other friend. And before you know it, they're going around to a friend's house that they don't know to play a game that you think they're playing. And it's not that at all. Yeah, it's terrifying when you sort of it look is. at all of those conversations. Yeah, so I'm all in favour of your work. And I... I, I want people obviously to follow you and, and with this recording as well, all the people that have been featured business guests before, I, I send everybody a copy of it. And we have a chat group, as I said, on LinkedIn, which I can add you to that. You don't have to chat every week. You don't have to chat at all. But if you're in the group, then you can see kind of what's going on with other people. And if there's something that you want to update the others on, then you're more than welcome to do so also. Thank okay. you. So it's been so nice to chat to you, James. I'm so pleased that Lynn's come and she turned her camera on. Uh, that's that's a big step for her, I know. Uh, but this is what's this is why these little little things are very very important. Um, and maybe next year I get Lynn on your show. Yeah, no, exactly. I mean, Lynn is more than welcome, and we should connect as well. So. She's not uh, on LinkedIn at the moment, but she will be. I'll okay. make sure of that. <laughs> I haven't got a clue about all that stuff. <laughs> yeah. But I'm, I mean, I'm a, yeah. I mean, people say, just a bad question a bit, people say, oh, you shouldn't do these things on, on LinkedIn. It's a business professional. And I say, hang on a minute. These things happen in the business professional world, and it's business professionals that have these problems as well. So why not identify? And sure. Well, and you know what? I try to keep everything different on different platforms mm -hmm. because I, because of that reason. But sometimes it does mean it does matter for me to share this because mm -hmm. people need to understand this powers my work, my voice, my very being, you know, as a behavioral change trainer. I mean, yesterday I was doing I think I shared with you, James, I was doing a corporate event yesterday. It was, mm -hmm. it was quite a big corporate event uh, or the day before but it all links in it to is. my work. And actually I can't be putting bullshit out there. This is who it is, like it or not, this is who I am. And you either buy into it or you don't, but this is the work that I'm doing now moving forward in all, I mean, even when you sort of think about my community businesses, it all, it's all really important. You know, my team are working with me now on safeguarding and doing, um, you know, student, uh, having a student support system which is brilliant. It's a great initiative for my team and me to work with. So it all works together. Uh, so this is it. This is me. This is who I am. I don't need to pretend anymore. I don't need to hide behind my story. Uh, this is this is it. And this is it. It's perfect. I mean, I, I love it. And every behind every business person, there's a story to share. And this is what I want to bring out. So Emma Thank Jane you. Taylor, you have been an absolutely wonderful guest. I've completely enjoyed your story. It resonates a lot with me from my own situation and my childhood, but also I'm sure it touches on many others. So thank you once again for being a wonderful guest. Thank you for having me with you today, James. An absolute pleasure.